You're listening to ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. Welcome to GI Insights, where we cover the latest clinical issues, trends, and technologies in gastroenterological practice. GI Insights is brought to you by AGA Institute. Your host for GI Insights is Professor of Medicine at University of Illinois Chicago, Dr. Jay Goldstein. Biologic agents are now being used more commonly for the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. Joining us to discuss what GIs need to know about the newer agents for the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease is Dr. Richard Fedorek, Professor of Medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology and Chair of the Center of Excellence for Gastrointestinal Inflammation and Immunity Research at the University of Alberta in Canada. Welcome, Dr. Fedorek. Thank you, Jay. Before biologics came into being available, we had an unmet need. What do you think that unmet need was? So prior to biologics in inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis, we relied heavily on really two drugs, but the dominant force was steroids, corticosteroids. The side effects from corticosteroids, short-term and long-term, we all recognized were enormous and not something that patients could use for the long-term. In the last decade, we moved into immunosuppressive therapy with azathioprine and then methotrexate, but that was not sufficient alone to actually gain significant advancement and prevent patients from moving rapidly to surgery, both for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So the biologics have really fundamentally changed access to surgeons, access to hospital care, access to a better quality of life for patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Just for our listening audience, let's define what we mean by biologics here. So the first biologics were those molecules which are antibodies against uh, anti-TNF. There are over 60 different biologics currently in the pipeline being investigated for inflammatory diseases like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis. We have only two now. We have antibodies against anti-TNF that block anti-TNF. And now we've got antibodies that block homing of a movement of the white blood cells from the bloodstream into the lamina propria of the gut, the so-called alpha-4, beta-7 inhibitors. You can think of these as really smart bombs. They are targeted therapy, very specific, all aimed at reducing inflammation one way or the other. Amongst the agents, especially the anti-TNF agents, there are several products. How do they differ, not going into individual products, but how do they differ in their molecular structure, immunogenicity, and the like? Those are very good questions. So there is infliximab, adalimumab, and sertilizumab. In general, one can think that they all function the same. They are antibodies directed against tumor necrosis factor, TNF. They either bind TNF, free TNF, or they bind up TNF that's already bound to various molecules, and in so doing, reduce inflammation. The infliximab is administered intravenously. The adalimumab has a more a human molecular structure to it, but I remind you it's not human exactly. And then the sertilizumab is a pegylated form. Each of these advances from infliximab to adalimumab to sertilizumab is all designed to increase efficacy while at the same time reducing the immunogenicity of these agents. We need to remember that these are foreign proteins that we're injecting into people, giving to people as medicine. And so our own bodies can sometimes see them as foreign and set up this immunogenicity reaction. When you get immunogenicity, you get adverse events, infusion reactions, and you begin to lose efficacy as these drugs get destroyed by our own bodies very quickly. That would manifest itself clinically by earlier, more frequent relapses, I take it. Right. You just don't respond to these medications like you used to because now instead of the biologic circulating in your body for eight weeks, 12 weeks, four weeks, it's quickly destroyed by your own body antibodies. So you're 
serum levels fall very quickly and you lose efficacy. When they first came out, we were very strict on the criteria for utilization and the frequency in administration. And there's been some flexibility over the years, hasn't there? Yes, exactly. Well, let's go first to the regimens that are available. We're using them at higher doses, more frequently, as time goes on. Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What should clinicians watch for? And how do you titrate them? I think the clinicians need to know that we are beginning to use immunosuppressive therapy earlier. We have conducted studies to see whether we should use immunosuppressive therapy from day one. And that's probably not ready for prime time yet, although more clinical trials are being conducted in that. But what we want to do with biologic and immunosuppressive therapy, Jay, is to get in there relatively early before there's structural damage in Crohn's disease or before the disease in ulcerative colitis has gotten so out of hand that there's no options but surgery. So many of us are still looking at this foundation of steroids. If you have a mild case of Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, you go on a course of steroids, you respond. We expect about a 40% remission rate out at a year. So 40% of the people will do really quite well with that one dose of prednisone. But Jay, if you have another flare of your disease within a year, or if you're high risk, and that is if you've got colonic disease, perianal fistulas, proximal to disease in the jejunum or family history or you're a smoker, all are high risk factors. You want to begin that immunosuppression earlier and you want to begin using azathioprine earlier. And you might even want to begin using an anti-TNF agent earlier. So you can see how we're shifting our therapy to be using these agents earlier, not yet at the very first day of diagnosis, but perhaps in the complex patient And in someone who's flaring more rapidly, you know, certainly within the second flare of their disease. What about using immunomodulators and the biologics together? Is there a cautionary note? Well, yes. And I'm going to tell you about two clinical trials which were just recently completed that are guiding us. We were using an anti-TNF biologic with either methotrexate or azathioprine in order to try and reduce immunogenicity. So reduce the antibodies being formed that would cause us to lose efficacy or get an infusion reaction. And we knew, we learned from the rheumatologist that that was a good thing to do because that's it works in rheumatology and in rheumatoid arthritis. So we conducted two randomized controlled trials. Both will be published very soon for your audience, but I can tell you a, a little summary of them. Infliximab plus methotrexate There was no synergistic benefit to having the two together. Infliximab alone was as good as infliximab plus methotrexate. So we probably shouldn't use those in combination for Crohn's disease. When you go to infliximab plus azathioprine compared to infliximab alone, in that recently completed study, there was significant benefit to using the infliximab plus azathioprine combination. Now, The discussion is around the balance and the side effects because of the potential for developing lymphoma associated with azathioprine. So we now need to have that discussion and have some additional thought go in. How long should azathioprine be continued? Should it be with the infliximab forever? Do we only use the azathioprine until the patient is well? So we have still some work to do there. But for your audience, it's important to know this clinical trial and to know that the use of infliximab and azathioprine together in combination therapy was better than infliximab alone. And personally, I am still continuing my patients on both those drugs together, awaiting further studies to identify and help me learn when I should be stopping azathioprine. Not everybody responds to biologics. If you start out with the standard dosing that people have been using in clinical trials, and that's what you recommend, correct? Correct. And they don't respond, are they going to be non-responders, or do we just go up on the dose? Good questions. I think we need to say there are primary non-responders and then secondary non-responders. Jay, a primary non-responder is I give you a biologic. It's the first time you've ever received it. 
and I give you the correct dose in the correct duration of time, and you get zero response. That's a primary non-responder. In those patients, as long as you've given them the induction dosing that's been described, it's unlikely that going up on the dose is going to have any benefit. In those patients who are primary non-responders, you're going to want to switch within the class and try another anti-TNF because we're now learning that you can switch from one to the other and not have benefit with one, but have benefit with another. In contrast, there's the secondary non-responders. So these are people who had the biologic, they were doing really well, are developing some antibodies to it, and now are losing efficacy. They're coming back and they say to you, geez, doc, I get recurrence of my Crohn's disease, you know, a few days or a few weeks before my next infusion. I'm just not feeling well for the whole time like I was before. In those cases, that's where you want to either increase the dose or shorten the duration to give them a little bit more drug in order to bring their disease back under control. Let's talk about patient safety here. We know that there's an increased incidence of lymphoma, tuberculosis, and other infections. Correct. What do we do to proactively control for this? And what should we be telling patients about long-term toxicity that we may or may not anticipate? Right. Well, these... These are excellent uh, questions in which we could spend the next hour discussing, but let me give you a bit of a summary. Tuberculosis. You absolutely need to uh, check and confirm that your patient does not have latent or certainly active tuberculosis because the anti-TNF agents are going to make that worse for sure. And so you need at least a MAN2 test, a skin test, and or a chest X-ray. If you do have latent or active TB, then you should consult your infectious disease specialist, but he or she is likely going to place your patient on some INH, some uh, TB prophylaxis, and then you can move forward with your anti-TNF agent. That's the very important thing. The other is about there is an increased risk of opportunistic infections with these anti-TNF agents. There is an increased risk of lymphoma. But what I'm telling my patients is medicine is a risk-benefit ratio you have an 80% chance of responding to these agents. They are likely to keep you out of hospital if you respond. They are likely to give you a better quality of life. You're likely to need less investigations and uh, visits to your physician. So that's the benefits. And you accept the small risks of an increased infection rate and a small increase in lymphoma rate. But those risks are so small that it's difficult for us to even measure them. And as long as the patient and the doctor are aware of them and are vigilant and your patient knows to come to you if there's any fever or any abnormal changes in their symptoms, then I think it's a manageable state. And as physicians, we practice that way all the time, risk versus benefit. And in this case, with anti-TNF agents and the new biologic agents, I believe that the benefits far outweigh the risks. That's great. I think you were absolutely correct. We could probably spend hours talking about it, but we don't have that time. I'd like to thank my guest from the University of Alberta in Canada, Dr. Richard Fedorak. Dr. Fedorak, thank you very much for being our guest on this week's GI Insight. Thank you, Jay. You have been listening to GI Insights on ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. GI Insights is brought to you by AGA Institute. For additional information on this program and on-demand podcasts, Visit us at ReachMD.com and use promo code AGA. Update your clinical knowledge and improve your delivery of patient care by registering for the 2010 AGA Clinical Congress. By attending, you'll learn from renowned experts in the field who will address the most relevant clinical issues in gastroenterology and hepatology. The Congress will be in Las Vegas January 15th and 16th with an optional add-on sedation course January 17th. Bring your nurse and attend this team-based course to obtain the essential information and hands-on training to safely and effectively administer sedation for GI procedures. Learn more and register today at www.gastro.org slash clinical congress. The American Gastroenterological Association is the trusted voice of the GI community. Our membership has grown to include 17,000 members from around the globe who are involved in all aspects of the science, practice, and advancement of gastroenterology. Discover what the AGA could mean to you. Visit www.gastro.org.